from KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. Tonight, our first look at 46-year-old Melissa Perez shot and killed by SAPD officers on Friday. This photo released by the law firm representing Perez's family. Today, we also received the mug shots of the three San Antonio police officers now charged with her murder. Alfred Flores has been on the SAPD force for 14 years. Nathaniel Villalobos, two years. And Eliezer Alejandro, five years. We also learned all three bonded out of jail today. So let's take a look at what happened, mostly shown through the body cam footage SAPD has already released. Early Friday morning, San Antonio police were called to the 6200 block of Old Pearsall Road on the southwest side. Police Chief Willie McManus said 46-year-old Melissa Perez was having a mental health crisis, cutting wires through the complex fire alarm system. SAPD released this body camera footage showing one officer approaching Perez in the parking lot while she was out with her dog. Hey, lady. Get over here. The officer begins running after her, the footage showing him hopping over a railing into Perez's balcony. Then he tears the screen off of the open window. The officer pulls away and raises up his gun. You're going to get shot. She, shoot me. McManus said Perez then got a hammer and approached officers. Yeah. Pettas then allegedly swung the hammer toward officers, hitting and breaking the window. Another officer's camera catches shots ringing out. The department said the officer's employment was terminated. In another instance, SAPD said they were suspended without pay. KSAT has reached out for further clarification. released a statement on behalf of Perez's daughter saying, quote, we have always been pro-police family. This breaks my heart. I always trusted the police to protect me. And now I don't know who to trust. I can't express how hurt we are, end quote. Well, today marks one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Over the past year, abortion has been banned in Texas. Lawmakers now acknowledging this means more people will be having babies and will need access to affordable products. They hope a new state law will ease the financial burdens of some family care products. The 19th's Avery Everett breaks down Senate Bill 379 and what it means for San Antonians. There's barriers everywhere. Packaging up a promise. Anything we can put into their pockets to purchase more health essentials is always great. The Texas Diaper Bank is pushing for more accessibility to diapers and menstrual products. It is not like people have a choice. Jorge Medina is the CEO of the Diaper Bank, and he says the signing of Senate Bill 379 is a step in the right direction. For many families who do not have the financial or economic means to purchase the necessary amount of diapers, uh, any money that we can put back in their pockets is something that's great. The law removes a sales tax for certain family care items. Products like menstrual pads, tampons, and diapers are all on that list. A year after Roe v. Wade was overturned, organizations on both sides of the decision say this law is long awaited. Texas recognizes that we have to do more because there will be even more births in our state, as we've seen. I mean, there's already social pressures as a woman to uh, consume products to make us, you know, look prettier and more attractive to the eye. So when it comes to stuff that we need just to get through the day, that's just a need. With sites set on September 1st to see this law set into place. It's just another step. Medina says it's packing a big purpose. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. On the anniversary of Roe being overturned tonight, both groups on opposite sides of the decision say their fight is far from over. We recognize that our work is not done. We have to work to maintain the gains that we've made. We have to work to keep our laws from being weakened. Full reproductive justice will be the end of it. And full reproductive justice won't be achieved when we uh, win the right to an abortion back. Two juveniles arrested and another is on the loose after shirts. Police say they led officers on a multi-county chase in a stolen vehicle. Investigators say the juveniles led Universal City Police on a chase into Shirts city limits early this morning, where Shirts PD joined that pursuit. The chase ended in a crash around 5 a.m. near Shirts Parkway. 
and police say they all ran from the scene. One was immediately arrested and another moments later after they allegedly pointed a gun at officers. Shots were fired at that suspect, but nobody was injured. And the officer involved is on administrative leave while the shooting is investigated. That third juvenile still on the run, but investigators say they are not an immediate threat to the community. San Antonio police still looking for a suspect. They say shot a teen downtown Friday night. It happened on Savio Street last night near I-10. The 19-year-old was shot in the legs and arm, but is expected to recover. Investigators say the suspect walked up to the teen's car, shot him, then took off. Right now, there is no suspect information available, but if you know anything about this incident, you're urged to call Crime Stoppers immediately at 224-STOP. An east side family is staying somewhere else tonight after their house caught fire on the city's east side. Firefighters were called to a home on Channing Avenue this afternoon after a fire broke out in the attic. Thankfully, nobody was hurt and fire crews say the house sustained minimal damage. But right now, investigators believe it was an electrical fire and estimate damages around $50,000. Bear County Sheriff's deputies need your help finding two suspects in connection to a car burglary. Take a look at your screen. Investigators say a suspect driving this car and a passenger broke into and stole money from a parked car on Port Elizabeth by Wagner High School. The car those suspects were in is this dark colored Jeep Cherokee. If you know anything about this incident, you're urged to call the Bear County Sheriff's Office. All right, switching gears now to a look outside with live cam this Saturday night. Pretty quiet in and around San Antonio and still warm and muggy. Upper 80s right now, feeling even hotter this 10 p.m. hour thanks to the humidity still in place. If you thought it was hot outside this afternoon, you certainly are right. 102 degrees was our high temperature over at SA International. This actually ties the existing record high that we have in place here in San Antonio of 100 that was set back in 2009 and 1994. In fact, Del Rio on top of that hit 108, which broke their existing record high of 106 that was set back in 2018. Now we still are expecting near to potentially even record heat, not just tomorrow, but even into portions of next week as well. 102, that forecast high temperature tomorrow, the record is 103. So we'll be monitoring the thermometer pretty closely, but of course, feeling closer to 110 thanks to the mugginess. So yes, we'll get you a look at that triple digit temperature trend and what we can expect over the next several days in just a few, Courtney. Thank you, Mia. Well, we are headed into the final week of Pride Month, but the celebration is far from over. Happening right now, people are parading downtown Main Avenue, Pride San Antonio. Our night beats Avery Everett is live out there right now. And Avery, we know this is a party with a purpose. I mean, Courtney, if you can't tell, people here are just proud to be together. In a year with a political spotlight on LGBTQ plus rights, people say tonight they're feeling freedom and they're coming together as a community. I mean, take a look. There are hundreds of people lining this street here. They say they're not just feeling the heat, but also love, hope and unity. This parade comes after a day of celebration in Crockett Park for the Pride Bigger Than Texas Festival. Organizers of the Pride San Antonio say this year they're calling for action as the ACLU reports that just under 500 anti LGBTQ plus bills have been brought up in state capitals across this country. Now this month might soon be over, but people here tell me their celebration doesn't stop at the calendar month. If you want to get involved and keep the spirit of pride alive throughout the year, we have links on our website, ksat.com. Reporting live, I'm Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. Straight ahead on the night beat, a disturbing trend that will not go away. Threats of violence against schools are increasing. KSAT investigates the consequences when a student themselves is the one that creates the crisis. Plus, burnt out on the industry. Veterinarians everywhere are saying enough is enough. Why they're leaving a field so many of us depend on. Plus, shifting focus after a week of search and rescue efforts, the Coast Guard changing gears to figure out how the Titanic submersible tragedy happened in the first place. Well, the Titan submersible tragedy captured the world's attention last week, and now the U.S. Coast Guard is taking the lead on the investigation into the loss of the sub and the five people who died on board. ABC's Jacqueline Lee breaks down the case from Boston.
The urgent investigation underway into the catastrophic implosion of the Titan submersible, killing all five passengers on board, with the NTSB now joining the U.S. Coast Guard in the search for answers. If they can collect enough of the pieces, they'll get a pretty good sense of where the flaw was. As investigative bodies converge on site, a recovery mission also poised to begin. A U.S. Navy-operated crane on standby in St. John's, Newfoundland, waiting on the U.S. Coast Guard to make the call on whether to retrieve the key pieces of evidence sitting on the ocean floor. The urgent investigation and recovery efforts coming as a defense official confirms that the Navy's sound surveillance system picked up the noise of the implosion on Sunday, allowing officials to quickly triangulate the location. There was a, a tremendous effort put forward to try to, to find the Titan as quickly as possible. A defense official saying the information was then shared with the Coast Guard immediately, but the search and rescue mission continued on until the debris was discovered by a ROV on Wednesday, confirming the sub had imploded. While the initial investigation could be lengthy, experts such as James Cameron, who built a sub himself to explore the Titanic wreckage over 30 times, pointing to the possibility of a failure of the carbon fiber hull. But that carbon fiber uh, composite cylinder is now just in very small pieces, so it's pretty clear that that that's what failed. But this morning, the OceanGate co-founder speaking out to defend the build and its CEO who died on board, Stockton Rush. He was very keenly aware of the risks of operating in a deep ocean environment, and he was very committed to safety. And as for look at a Florida man and his teenage stepson are dead after a tragic chain of events in Big Bend National Park. A release today from the Parks Communication Center said the father was hiking in the extreme heat with his two stepsons, ages 14 and 21. Temperatures at the time, 119 degrees. The 14-year-old fell ill along the trail and lost consciousness. They say the father rushed back to the car to get help, but then crashed the car nearby. Rangers and Border Patrol agents who responded pronounced them both dead at the scene. Both agencies still investigating the incident. The Supreme Court rejected a Republican-led challenge to President Biden's immigration guidelines. In an 8-1 to one ruling, the court revived the policy that prioritizes which non-citizens to deport. Acting Texas Attorney General John Scott challenged that policy, saying it conflicted with immigration law. The court said Texas did not even have the right to sue in the first place. The ruling sets a precedent for states who challenge federal policies that they don't agree with. Well, we were just talking about these stories and how devastating this heat can be. It's really a terrible but important reminder that you need to be safe out there. We need mm -hmm. water and really to be planning where you are and to really be looking at like the case at weather app to see where things are going to get really hot. Yeah, exactly. Even out in the sun, even in the shade still because of all of the humidity, that's where those feels like temperatures come into play. And yes, it has been just an incredibly hot stretch of days across South Central Texas. I know we've been preaching it a lot, but heat safety is so, so important when we do have these kind of temperatures and this mugginess in place as well. And it's not really going anywhere in terms of the heat. So we've got high pressure off to our southwest right now. It still is the main driver of our weather pattern. But here's the thing. Over the next couple of days, it's actually going to move over the Lone Star State and really strengthen over the state of Texas, which means the heat is going to continue. Those triple digit temperatures are in the forecast tomorrow and all the way through next week. So we'll need to monitor that very closely. The good news, a little silver lining here, especially by the first half of next week, we could see a slight break in the humidity, which would help with those heat index values. So we'll need to monitor that as well. But until then, we still have all of that mugginess in the air late this Saturday night. White numbers, the actual air temperatures, yellow numbers, those heat index values. It still feels like the 90s here in San Antonio, 94. That feels like temperature in Bulverde. Still feels like 101 up in Canyon Lake. 93 is that heat index value over there in New Braunfels. So there's that big blue H, that high pressure system that we've been talking about. You can see it's just off to our southwest, but this is what's going to happen in the upper levels of the atmosphere. You can see really as we head into Monday and Tuesday, 
that sets up over the state of Texas and with high pressure systems. We see sinking air and as that air sinks to the ground, it compresses and that's what helps those temperatures warm up so much. So near record heat is expected at times over the next several days. We we're talking about this a little bit earlier tomorrow. The current forecast high here in San Antonio is 102. As of right now, that would be one degree shy of the existing record of 103 that was set back in 2012, but we'll need to watch that even as we head into Tuesday 104 that forecast high that's near the record of 105 that was set back in 1980. But we're talking about that humidity you can see right now dew points how we measure that moisture here in the atmosphere in the 60s and 70s. So it is definitely noticeable when you step outdoors. But as we take a look at our dew point trend, especially by Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. That's when we could see that slight break in the humidity in the afternoon hours, and that would keep the heat index values closer to the actual air temperature, which would be good news. So we'll keep eyes on that as well. But until then, it's going to be a muggy start to your Sunday morning. Mid to upper 70s expected in and around the San Antonio area, like what we saw earlier this morning and really the past several mornings. Some morning cloud cover is expected, but I do think that's going to break up a bit more, especially by lunchtime. We're going to see plenty of sunshine here in San Antonio. You can see what that's going to do to our temperatures. Low 90s already. We've got that forecast high around 102 here in town. 101 in Seguin, 101 in Poteet, 104 out there in Divine, of course, feeling closer to 110 and maybe even south of San Antonio. Those feels like temperatures climbing to about 115 degrees. So definitely take it easy as we've been talking about in this heat, because you can see as we take a look at that seven day forecast, not a whole lot in terms of rain chances. It's just more of those triple digits, Courtney. Yep. Keep watching out for yourselves. Thank you so much, Mia. Well, Larry, Wemby had a welcome dinner that I don't think he will ever forget. Absolutely not. Can you imagine sitting down to dinner with Coach Pop and some other of the greatest Spurs to ever play? That's exactly what Wimbanyama got to do as the Spurs try to take care of their number one overall draft pick and their second rounder, Sissoko. He wants to defend one of the best players in the NBA coming up. The Coyotes here. So you get to show off your t shirt arms. T shirt toss. Better stand up. The two newest Spurs thrilled fans at the Arneson River Theater thanks to a t shirt toss in Big Board Sports. From the Arneson River Theater to the AT&T Center it was a busy day for the Spurs and their two draft picks, Victor Wimanyama and C.D. Sissoko. Late this morning, the Spurs held to meet the rookies at the AT&T Center to introduce the two French basketball players to the media and Spurs employees. With family members right there by their side, the Spurs played a video for each player before they made a grand entrance to the stage. Both teenagers were all smiles. Spurs general manager Brian Wright, the architect of making all this happen, had this to say to Wimby and his family. Welcome to the Women Yama family, um, to Buna, to Issa, friends, coaches, all of you in attendance. Um, hopefully you all have felt the love dating back to draft lottery night, to arriving yesterday, and then here today. Uh, to Victor, I wanted to say to you directly, we're excited to grow with you, support you, challenge you, especially Coach Pop. There'll be a lot of challenging there. Um, on your journey through life and basketball. Your talent is obvious, but as we got to know you, the maturity, the approach, um, the character really showed us how special of a young man you are. And as an organization, we're extremely excited to welcome you to the city of San Antonio and to the Spurs family. Part of Wimby's welcome to the Spurs. He got to have dinner last night with Coach Pop, Tim Duncan, David Robinson, Manu Ginobili, and Sean Elliott. Talk about a thrilling dinner, getting to hang out with Spurs legends and the goat of coaches. It's such, such, a, such comforting to see that these people who are so important to the city of San Antonio and to the franchise are such kind people and generous because they genuinely wanted to, to share with me their experience. And, uh, you know, yeah, I feel like they, they've already started to take great care of me. And uh, it's also, 
I think it's also the position uh, Tim Duncan was in when he came in he, because he told me he, he had to he just had to look up to to David Robinson to and, and Sean Elliott to yeah to and follow the, their path and he knew he was in good hands. Both guys are in good hands with the Spurs. C.D. Sissoko was drafted in the second round, 44th overall. He's a dynamic defender, stands six foot eight, and he's 19 as well. C.D. was asked, "Who does he want to d up at the NBA level?" Ladies and gentlemen, mm, that's a tough one. Mm, I would definitely say Scoot, like my teammates from Ignite, and definitely LeBron. So, you know, but uh, knowing I know this this summer we got a good game against uh, the Portland, so. That would be the first game, so yeah, I'm going to be there, so yeah. Love it. He wants to go after LeBron. Now, before the presser at the 18T Center, the Spurs held a private party at the Arneson River Theater, where those guests got to see both the teenagers in person. Sean Elliott was the host, and he asked CD about his thoughts of the Spurs while growing up, back when the team was winning five NBA titles with the Big Three. This team like to win. Like, like to win championships, so... No, TP, great job, team. Manu did a great job here with you guys and uh, with some rings. So, no, I uh, just want to be like them. So, I hope we get a ring one day. So, yeah, you know, it's a great goal. But, yeah. That is a fantastic goal. Wimby and CD sport their new uniforms later in sports. Courtney. They carry themselves so well for Don't being they? so young. Very impressive. Very mature for 19. Yep. All right. Thank you, Larry. See you soon. Still to come on the night beat, facing the consequences. School threats are happening now more than ever. KSAT investigates what happens when a student causes the crisis. We are seeing it more often, violent threats at schools. FBI data shows those threats increased 60% between 2021 and 2022. But what happens when a student makes a threat? KSAT Investigates' Dillian Collier explains the real-life consequences that follow. I think that the situation got way out of hand. Shelly Quinn's 12-year-old son has Asperger's syndrome, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and according to school records reviewed by KSAT Investigates, has been a target of bullies for much of his academic life. He had been enrolled at the School of Science and Technology Hill Country less than a week when in late March, Quinn got a call from the vice principal. Telling us that we needed to come get our son, that um, he had stated that he had a gun in his locker. By the time San Antonio police showed up, the allegations had morphed dramatically, including claims that days earlier, the child referenced the Nashville school shooting, which occurred the same week, that he also had knives, bullets, and magazines, said he was the son of Satan, and had attempted to recruit classmates to help him kill other students. Days later, Quinn says deputy U.S. Marshals and Medina County Sheriff's deputies arrived at her property before sunrise with a felony warrant for her son's arrest. Full on gear, um, bulletproof vest, rifles, flashlights. They wanted to go barge down into his room and wake him up and I, I begged them to let me go do it. While many San Antonio sixth graders were wrapping up their final week of school, the child was in Bear County Juvenile Court for a mandatory appearance. His trial for making a terroristic threat tentatively scheduled for late next month. Quinn says the ordeal, although caused by her son, has made him terrified for his future. What is your response then to people who are going to see this and say, well, he threatened classmates, no matter what kind of threat it was, uh, he gets what's coming to him. My husband and I are very understanding in the situation. We know the severity of what happened. We don't condone it. We understand it. We're compassionate towards it. The Bear County District Attorney's Office declined to comment on the criminal case because the boy is a minor. A spokeswoman for the School of Science and Technology Hill Country confirmed that Quinn withdrew her son before he could be formally expelled, but that he is not welcome back on campus. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Well, the Justice Department special counsel is asking for a December trial date for the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. A South Florida federal judge had previously scheduled the trial for August. Special counsel Jack Smith's office has a list of 84 witnesses that former President Trump is not allowed to contact about the case. 
Trump has pleaded not guilty to all 37 charges of the alleged mishandling of government documents. The proposed new date for the trial is not final and Trump's legal team could ask for it to be rescheduled. To Russia now, where the country is increasing security across the whole country after accusing Wagner, a Wagner mercenary chief of indicting, inciting rather, the armed rebellion. The leader of the Russian paramilitary group launched a tirade against the Russian military on Friday night, openly accusing soldiers of attacking a Wagner camp and killing his men. He vowed retaliation and insinuated his force would destroy any Russian resistance. The Wagner group says it is taking control of Russian military facilities in two cities. He has clarified the offensive is, quote, a march of justice and not a coup. But the Kremlin and Putin have said those preparing for an armed rebellion will be punished. Overnight, though, a turn of events when he pulled back his troops, saying he did not want to see Russian bloodshed. Well, after two days of testimony, the defense rested its case in the trial of Scott Peterson, the former school resource officer that was on duty during the Parkland, Florida school shooting. 17 people were killed and 17 more were injured in the Valentine's Day shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School back in 2018. Peterson is facing several counts of child neglect and culpable negligence for his alleged inaction to stop the gunman. He's also accused of lying to investigators about the number of gunshots he heard after arriving at the scene of the crime. Peterson did not testify, and closing arguments are scheduled for Monday. The Directors Guild of America voted to approve a new contract with movie studios. The three-year deal was approved by more than 80% of its members. The deal comes as the Writers Guild of America strike enters its eighth week with no signs of progress thus far. The Directors Guild contract secured higher pay, addressed, addressed the use of artificial intelligence, and bans the use of live ammunition on set, a direct result of the 2021 death on the set of the movie Rust. Still to come on the night beat, people so many of us depend on are leaving the field at an alarming rate. Why veterinarians in San Antonio are saying enough is enough. That's next.